Good morning again. Yeah, it's kind of funny to me talking about encircling buckles because I trained with Dr. Scapins who never did encircling buckle alone, which in, in Europe they call a cerclage, which I think is kind of a fitting description for an encircling buckle. But let's talk for a minute about what are the three principles that are involved with the repair of a retinal detachment. Number one, we localize the break. Number two, we must release the vitreoretinal retinal traction. And number three, we create a chorial retinal adhesion or scar. And so those are the principles, but there's different ways that we can affect those principles. You can localize with a chandelier using the uh, operating microscope. You can localize with an indirect uh, ophthalmoscope. You can release the vitreous traction with a vitrectomy or with a buckle or both and you can create an adhesion with diathermy, laser, or cryo. But what have we learned from ret pneumatic retinopexy? What we've learned is that you can repair a detachment in many cases by just applying two of those three principles. When we do pneumatic, we localize the break, and we create a chorial retinal adhesion. But the gas bubble does not eliminate the vitreoretinal retinal traction. And in fact, pneumatic retinopexy only works if there's limited persistent vitreous traction on the break. If there's too much traction on the break, your pneumatic retinopexy will fail. And that's really one of the principles of identifying the correct patient for pneumatic retinopexy is by trying to estimate how much residual traction is on the break. So the bottom line is, is as I think about it, is that if I can fix a number of patients by applying just two out of the three principles, do I need a permanent scleral buckle in all cases? And if I don't need, and if I even need a buckle, how high does it have to be? So I'll make those two points. Now, what's the history? Scleral resection was done by actually uh, undermining the sclera and, uh, and creating a buckling effect. And then later, Aruga in Spain talked about the, uh, the Aruga suture, which could be nylon, silk, supermid, and it was just basically creating a dam or an encircling um, buckling effect uh, uh, just posterior to the break, and the problem with those is that there was a lot of intrusion, and you could have a detachment persistent anterior to that buckling effect. And then Scapins started with the poly polyethylene tube and then later the silicone band. So this is a typical Scapins type of buckle, a tire, a very broad tire, and the Scapins principles are basically what we call the Boston buckle, is you localize the brake, you place the brake so that it's in the middle of the span of the, of the tire, and you buckle the extent of the detachment, but trying to avoid buckling more than 180 degrees. So that's, that's basically the principles of a scapins buckle, and that the encircling band that goes through the groove is just gentle enough to keep the edges of the buckle down and, and hold it in place w without um, losing your height. But why do we use an encircling buckle? Well, we know they work. They're fast. You don't have to have re, you know, precise localization. And in skilled hands, it's very low risk and it's very inexpensive. So we like to do the encircling band. And so here's an encircling band. Usually it's about two to, two to three millimeters behind the muscle insertions. This is a little bit further back. I prefer to anchor it in place with a nylon suture. Some people can use, will use Vicryl. Some people do belt loops. I have a problem with belt loops because sometimes I place it with my suture and I don't like the position and I cut the suture and replace it. If I make a belt loop, it's harder to, to adjust. And also I don't like to thin the sclera any more than it's already th uh, thin. So how, what is the mechanism of a buckle? Why do we do this? How does it work? Well, it reduces vitreous traction, but it also reduces the currents within the eye. So here's a, uh, from a paper of scapins, here's the vitreous traction, and a buckle uh, indenting the wall of the eye here is going to release that traction. But there's another mechanism, and that is the fluids, as the eye uh, saccades, moves up and down, there's fluid currents in the eye, and the fluid currents get underneath the retina and elevate it. And so by placing a buckle on the eye, you're re not only reducing the traction, but you're also affecting how the fluid, fluid currents work 
on the eye. So those two major effects. So I will not talk about in this um, uh, presentation about detachments in patients who are younger who have no posterior vitreous detachment. I think that is the one indication where a buckle alone is, is quite sufficient to uh, fix these eyes. And so the pro study group uh, excluded all patients under the age of 40, therefore trying to identify only people that have had a posterior vitreous attachment as the underlying etiology of their, of their um, retinal detachment. And so, uh, and what you can see in their various reports is that in the phagic patient, a buckle alone versus a buckle vit were similar, whereas a vit alone was not nearly as successful. In their pseudo phagic patients, in all cases, whether it was a superior detachment or an inferior detachment, vitrectomies alone had success rates in the 80%, whereas vitrectomy buckle was in the 90%. And this is something that I don't think anybody likes to brag about their, the results of their retinal surgery is that is inferior retinal detachments. Superior detachments are easy. You put a gas bubble in the eye and the patient sits up, but inferior detachments due to presence of gravity, that's much more complex. And you can see that vitrectomy alone with inferior breaks had a 76% success rate, whereas vitrectomy with buckle was 87%. So still not in the 90s, but certainly much better. So how do we apply the buckle? Well, I already showed you some images of that, the different components that are available, uh, the 240, the 41, 42, 4050. I prefer the 41 band. If it's a very large eye, I'll use the 4050, which is a five millimeter strip. But that, that's kind of personal choice. You can uh, place it about three millimeters posterior to the muscle insertions, belt loops versus sutures a Watsky sleeve versus a clove hitch, and the clove hitches can be nylon, mersaline, or polydioxinone. And so one, one pearl that I want to give you is that I think it can be very easy to over-tighten a band. And then you see the patient post-op and you say, oh my God, what was I thinking? This band is so high. And, and what happens there is you also increase the, the myopia quite a bit. So one of the things I like to do is create what I call a happy band. So first of all, I pressurize the eye. If, I've done, if I'm doing a vitrectomy and applying the band after or during the vitrectomy, I raise the eye pressure to 60 while I'm adjusting the tension. Therefore, I don't overly tighten the band. And the second thing I do is I just pull on it a little bit and I want it to be happy. I, I, I don't want it to snap back against the eye too vigorously. There's a lot of different tricks for to avoid making it too tight, but this is the one that I, I like. And again, here are the different bands you can use, different styles. And although this is the, the tire, if you use the broader band, the 4050 or a 4060, you can imbricate it as, as you would with a tire and get some height in that one area, and yet you can still encircle using the same element. And that's, uh, that gives you the advantages of both an encircling band and, a, um, and the tire effect. And also, if you use an encircling band but the break is a little bit posterior, you can use a meridional implant, such as a 112 or a, or a 109, and put that under the band. So I thought I was very unique and very clever in saying, well, do we really need a permanent band in every case, and I think it really depends on the status of the vitreous. If you're doing a vitrectomy and it's really sticky, broad-based uh, vitreous, I think I might want more of a permanent buckling effect, whereas in most cases, if I can do a good vitrectomy, I want to have that high per percentage success rate that we get with a vit buckle, but I don't want the lasting uh, myopia, particularly when patients are pseudophagic and they've paid a lot of money to have their premium implant lenses with uh, the uh, multifocal lenses and so on, and then permanently screw that up with a very tight buckle. So I, I thought I was uh, very innovative in, in uh, using a releasable uh, knot, but instead uh, I found this paper from China. But this is a clove hitch. It's a sailor's knot 
a mountain climber knot, and, uh, and this is a suture I tend to use, which is absorbable. It's a type of Vicryl, but it lasts a couple of months, maybe three months, before it totally uh, dissolves and um, verts the eye back to a normal configuration. So you get the height of the buckle initially. I think you get the uh, very good success rate with it, but then you don't induce so much myopia. And this is how you can tie it. If you're not good at sailor knots, you can just simply wrap the suture around. Another pearl I'll share with you is that when you pace, uh, pass a band around the eye, if you cut the ends so that they're matching, when you uh, encircle the eye, both cuts should go the same direction, and that way you know the band's not twisted. So it's another uh, pearl for you. What to avoid? A tight buckle can cause intrusion, the myopic shift, acute glaucoma, particularly in, in hyperopic eyes. A very broad buckle can uh, cause a croidal detachment, particularly in older people, and a tight buckle can cause anterior segment ischemia. Obviously, you want to be very careful making your belt loops or your suture passes to avoid uh, hemorrhage, uh, endophthalmitis, or inducing a retinal break. We always say that when you're working with trainees, with fellows, you let them pass their sutures over the area of detached retina first, not uh, over the area of detached retina, not attached retina, so they don't make a break, at least if they perforate. And here's some images of patients who've had encircling bands and you can see the silicone through the uh, overlying retina. And this does not make me happy when, when I see this. And, um, and I usually go back. I would never remove the bands, but I will go uh, back over the Watsky sleeve when I see someone like that and just cut the sleeve and relax the band. And you can see when you cut it, it just goes whoosh and retracts uh, very quickly. Fortunately, none of these are my cases. These are patients that I've inherited. And what you're looking for when you see a patient with a tight band is you're looking for these pigmentary changes that are not from cryo. This is just from the pressure of the band itself. And when you are following somebody with a tight band and you start seeing these pigmentary changes, that's when you know we have to go back and cut the band. And here's a patient that had a tight band and they still had a retinal detachment posterior to it years and years later. And here's a tight band, again, with the pigmentary changes. And this is a patient who has a, a very high 360 buckle. And it's not intruding by any means, but I don't think it looks very good from an um, um, artistic, if you will, standpoint. Certainly much higher than you need. And this is a polyethylene tube from the Scapin's air. This is a patient who had had retina surgery back in the 1950s, and she had recurrent vitreous hemorrhages from this uh, tube, which I elected not to touch. And this is a, an Aruga suture, and you can see that it just creates like a dam effect. But very often, the, the retina is detached. Um, has anyone ever seen an Aruga suture? I saw one patient from Bulgaria years ago. And, and it had intruded under the retina, and she was having recurrent hemorrhages, and I elected not to touch it. But anyway, that's those. Uh, I thought I'd share my experience with encircling bands with you. Thank you very much. to put uh, if uh, one wants to do a vitrectomy well pseudophagic eyes it's nearly 100% vitrectomy now in our country and most of us are using you know it's only in myopic eyes that we put in a inferior 276 support 180 degrees but then you have in your own country another group which doesn't believe in buckles at all. So I want to know your thoughts on it, and Nitin can also give his thoughts. I have a partner who has never done a buckle in his life. And if he has a patient who is young, who does not have a PVD, he'll actually refer the patient to me 
for a buckle rather than do a vitrectomy in that case. But so he, he has a very good success rate doing vitrectomy alone for inferior detachments, but he uses C3F8 and he keeps the patient positioned for a week or two. I find that by using my buckle, and I like a 276, but I will also encircle uh, using a uh, clove hitch that dissolves so they don't get persistent myopia. And I can use SF6 or even probably just regular air, room air, and maybe positioning for a day or two and send them back to work. So, so I do think I have a high success rate with that. Well, I, the last time I did a retinal detachment was 22 years ago, so I don't think I have much use. But I can tell you this much, that we run a program in East Timor, in Timor-Leste, which is a very small country near Australia. And uh, in introducing uh, retinal detachment surgery there, we've gone straight for the buckle because that's something that's doable, it's affordable, and it works. Before Dr. Nitin's talk, I would like to have two quick perspectives on the same question from Dr. Sangeet Mittal, who practices high volume retina in Punjab, and from Dr. Gadre, who practices a good volume retina in Gujarat. So one of the indications I do buckle is the uh, it's the configuration of the retina, which is sometimes called zipper syndrome. When you are doing a vitrectomy, sometimes you see there are multiple uh, horseshoe tears, which are spread all over the temporal retina. And in those uh, eyes, we generally found that there's a band of uh, band-like vitreous, which is attached at the vitreous base. I know in those eyes, I've found that if, if we only do vitrectomy, it leads to very high failure rate. And in those cases, the encircling band is very useful. That is uh, one place I generally do encircling band. Dr. Gadre. Thank you. Uh, I follow whatever is the um, general trend, actually. Whenever in doubt, especially about inferior uh, tears or... Uh, PVR mainly restricted in the lower half. I give support with an encircling band. 